Okay, hi. Uh, the, uh, I'm Mark Seeger, and I'm uh, with the cloud group at, uh, at Sousa, obviously. And I've been working on cloud storage for maybe a half a dozen years, give or take. And during the course of the, uh, during the process, I had um, developed some benchmarking tools that I wanted to uh, share with you and talk about what they do and how to use them. So I think one of the biggest questions that people don't ask or, or don't necessarily think to ask is, well, why do you even bother benchmarking? Because I think benchmarking means different things to different people. Um, sometimes people want to just, you know, merit, you know, measure the various loads, you know, that a particular, you know, benchmark is going to produce on the system. But sometimes you want to be able to compare the benchmarks, the performance of different configurations. If I have a system with this much memory in it versus that much memory or this number of disks versus that number of disks or this CPU, et cetera. And you want to be able to compare them to see, because it's not necessarily just running a single benchmark and a single configuration going to give you, that may be what you want, but you may want more. Um, and then, of course, the other big thing about benchmarking that not everybody necessarily worries about is scaling. You know, you run a particular benchmark load on a system, then you start increasing the load, and you want to see, well, is it scaling? Is the, uh, the rate of whatever it is I'm measuring going up? If I double, if I double the number of uh, systems, am I going to double, you know, the numbers that the benchmark is producing? And... Sometimes you want to see what happens when you exceed the excessive load. You know, the, the manufacturer says, don't exceed X. Well, I want to exceed X and see what happens, because sometimes that's going to happen in the real world. And the big question isn't so much, is the application going to start performing worse, because when you exceed the expected levels, it is going to perform worse. But more importantly, is it going to crash? And that's an important thing, because sometimes people don't realize that, you know, they're sitting, they're sitting on a ticking time bomb that, you know, all of a sudden, you know, some application, you know, uh, ticket sales to see, um, you know, the Backstreet Boys or something goes crazy and your, vent and your servers crash because you can't handle the increased load. Um, Another biggie has to do with regressions. A lot of times you come out with a new version of software and you want to know, well, is my performance still what it used to be? Has it regressed? Maybe I've got some bugs in the new code. And then, of course, there's always anomalous behavior as well. Sometimes you run a benchmark in it. It just, you're looking for odd behaviors. So I think some things that are very important with benchmarking is that the whole, the whole notion of repeatability. A lot of times people will run a test, say their system seems to be running slower than it did two days ago. And the question is, well, did you collect the data two days ago and now you're comparing it? Or are you just kind of getting a feeling that it's running slow? You, you need to be able to run multiple tests repeatedly every time with the same settings. And of course, when you want to drill down and see what's going on, it's really important to have timestamps in the tests that you're running so that if you say, geez, at 302, something weird happened, I want to see what my disks were doing at 302. If you don't have timestamps everywhere, you can't really do that level of correlation. And then, of course, you also want to be able to have parallelism involved because if you're going to be running a benchmark on a single machine, you may want to be running on multiple machines. And in the case of object storage, you typically have multiple users hitting your object storage from different machines. Well, you may want to benchmark that behavior and see what happens if you have five, ten machines all hitting the object storage at the same time from different machines. So your benchmarks need to support that. And of course, if you want, if you want to be able to drive, your, uh, drive whatever you're benchmarking to exceeding its limits, then you need to be able to drive it at very high loads. This is a potential contentious issue, is the whole thing about client-side APIs. I was talking to some people about um, Ceph, specifically, performance, and they said they have this tool called Fio that they use to benchmark Ceph. And Fio is a pretty cool tool. It, um, it, it, it's very low level, you run it, and it talks directly into the systems, into, into Ceph, bypassing all this client-side stuff. But the problem I see with something like that is you really want to see how the clients are going to behave. If, if a customer wants to use 
wants to buy a product from you that you've benchmarked, they don't want to see theoretical numbers. They want to know what kind of numbers they can expect to see themselves. And depending on that client-side performance, it's re I believe it's really important to be able to benchmark that kind of thing. And then, of course, you want flexibility in your test, which is kind of an all-encompassing, you know, whatever. And I think I'll, I'll give you an idea what I'm really getting to with that. So just to give you a little, a, just a, a real, real quick look at history. I first got involved in this somewhere in the five, six years ago time frame doing SWIFT, object storage benchmarking. And at the time, there wasn't really a whole lot around. There was this tool, Cosbench. And again, I don't, are any, just show hands, anybody ever do any, object storage kinds of stuff. Cause, so have you played with Cosbench? Yeah, because Cosbench, Cosbench first came out like five years ago. It was kind of a cool tool. Um, one of the problems I had with Cosbench, it was Java-based, and Java actually runs better, faster than Python. Well, if customers are going to be running Python, and I run Java, then the numbers aren't necessarily going to correlate. So I wanted to do stuff that was Python-based. The other thing that's happened with, with Cosbench, whether or not you've been following it, the developer left the project a couple years ago. So support's kind of, from what I've heard, support's not so hot. And it works, and people love it, and they continue to use it, but if something goes wrong, then, well, I'm not sure what your, I'm not sure what your recourses are. So anyhow, again, at the time, my standard answer as a developer would always be, well, you know, it's probably easier for me to just write my own. So I, I kind of wrote my own, and that's where get put came from. So in terms of what get put does, it kind of has some basic capabilities that most, most of these like object storage kind of tools have. You can do gets, you can do puts, you can do deletes, and you can, and you can um, measure how fast it's doing the gets, puts, and deletes in terms of like IOPS or megabytes a second. It's nothing really exotic. And from, from the get put perspective, it really is focused on a fixed object size. And this is also a really important concept. A lot of people will have these tools that do mixed workloads. And that's one of the things that um, Cosbench does that's actually pretty cool. So you can run Cosbench and you can say, I want to do 30% reads and 70% writes and tell me how it performs. Great. And, and in fact, I've added support to, to get put since, which I'll talk about later. But the point was, I wanted to be able to focus on repeatability. And if you're going to run a mixed workload, I'm not sure you can guarantee that if I ran a test and I did 30 gets and 70 puts, the next time I run the test, what if it does 32 gets and 68 puts? Well, it's not a big difference. But if I want repeatability, I want to know that the exact thing is going to happen again. Because if something goes wrong, I want to be able to repeat that failing test over and over and over. So again, it, it's, a different, it's a different kind of a philosophical kind of thing. So what I did when I put together get put is I wanted to be able to have a very simple command that would do a whole lot of stuff. So for example, you can give it a list of object sizes, not one object size. You can give it a list of how many threads you want it to run and a list of the tests you want to try. And then it will iterate through all the different kinds of permutations. So you can give it one command that might run for two, three, four, or five hours and generate an all kinds of information on, you know, on a 4K object that took this long and got these IOPS, then on an 8K object it did this and it did this, uh, with three threads, with eight threads, with 20 threads, and then you wind up with this whole set of permutations from a single test. So anyhow, to get to kind of the basics, um, and is this, can you read this stuff back there? Kind of, sort of. So basically what this is showing, at the very top, I ran a very simple test. I said, do a get, a put, and a delete, and run it for 10 seconds. And this is the kind of output you get. So you're able to see the uh, start and end times, how many megabytes a second it did. See, the operations there was 243, and the reason it was 243 was I said run it for 10 seconds. If I run it over and over and over again, you might get a different number of operations each time. If you want to get a specific number of operations, I could have said do 250 operations or 500 operations or whatever, and every single time you would run it, you would get the same number of operations. It also tells you how many IOPS you got, which is just ops. 
it, I'm sorry, the apps per second is the, is the number of IOPS. Sometimes you may get an error. It's almost never, it's almost never non-zero. It's, it's always zero virtually. And then important numbers are latency, which is really how long, what was the average time per put or per get or per delete. And then it'll give you the latency, it'll also give you the uh, latency range. And that's kind of an important number too. In this case, you can see the latency range of the puts went from uh, uh, 30 milliseconds to 70 milliseconds. And again, that's not surprising because object storage is very um, statistical in the sense that not every put is going to take the exact same amount of time. Test on the bottom is simply repeating it. And if you look at the command I gave it, if you can see it, it says run with a size of 1K, then 100K, and then run with one process, then two processes. And when you look at the table of the output, this top piece was for one, pro one thread, and the bottom one was for two threads. And then it runs the get, put, and delete for 1K, and then it repeats it for 100K. And if you could imagine a command up here that has a half a dozen different object sizes, you know, in 10 or 15 different combinations of number of processes, you actually wind up with quite a bit of output. And, and trying to look at all that output can be a little difficult, which I think is what I was saying in my next slide. So you can actually take that output and you can like do a grep on put and it'll summarize all, just the puts. Or you could do a grep on 1K and it'll summarize all the 1K objects. But that's kind of clunky. It works, but it can be a little bit of clunky. So I came up with this tool that I called uh, GPSum, which is my get put summarizer. And this particular, this particular data was generated from a file of 2,000 lines of output. And you can see I've got it summarized into like 10 or 12 lines of output. And on the left, it shows me how many threads the test ran, or parallel processes. And it went from 1 up to 96. And basically, when you run this tool, you say, of all the data on that previous page, pick one column and just blast it into this matrix. So in this case, on the top, I'm looking at megabytes per second. And, and as you can see, um, on the 1K objects, looking at megabytes per second gets a little bit silly because the numbers are really, slow, are really small. Um, but when you start getting up to 128K or even 512K objects, now at least the megabytes per second start, start to make a little bit of a difference. I ran the exact same GPSum command, and this time said, I want to look at IOPS, and that's what's on the bottom. So everything here is totally correlated, this exact same data set. And, and now, when you look at, for example, since 512K objects are a half a megabyte, these numbers are exactly double the numbers up above, because that's the way math works. Um, and, and the thing that's more useful when you look at small objects is the IOPS. And here we can look at the IOPS on the puts. It also makes it very, very obvious that, and again, this, I, I kind of like spend my life looking at these kinds of tables because what it tells you immediately is I doubled the, I doubled the clients from one to two and I doubled the IOPS from 95 to 195. I doubled them again from two to four and it, quite doubled, but it's close enough to be within a margin of error. So it's scaling really nicely from one process to two process to four process. I go up to eight, doubling it again, and it's still, it's still scaling pretty damn good. It went up, it's almost double what the, what the four was. And at 16, it scales real nicely. 32, we're now... No, 32 is scaling pretty well, too. When you get up to... Uh, Thir I'm sorry, when you get it to 32, it's starting to tail off a little bit because instead of from 1,300, we would have looked, we would have looked for 2,600 and we only got 2,300. But it's doing all right. But, you know, up at, six, up at 48, now we're starting to see it's not getting up to 46. It's only getting up to 30. Pardon? Yeah, not even close. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. 
I'm sorry, you're absolutely right. I should really be carrying the four. So 48 should be like triple 16, and triple 13 is 39. So yeah, so scaling this would have been closer to 40. But again, it's not, it's not a shock. You know, as you scale, things don't grow quite as quickly. And certainly going from 48 to 64, we've increased it by 16, and 16 is like 1,300, and, and we, we only went up by like 500. So, I mean, it's pretty obvious that once you're up in the, above 48, you know, your scaling is tapering off. And that's not a bad thing. You know, we're just simply saying, okay, from this quick, from this quick snapshot, you can see that under load, yeah, once you get up to, you know, 48, 50 threads, things start slowing down. And once you get up to 80 threads, for all intents and purposes, these last two lines are the same. You know, you're really, you're really not scaling anymore. Again, perfectly fine. But it's also saying it's not falling over. I've run tests where I could take this same system, run it at two or 300 processes, and you might see the number of puts per second going down, but it's not going to fall over. And that's really the main thing that you're looking for. So anyhow, that's kind of a long, a long ramble. I apologize for that. But a couple of interesting things that I found when I was running get put. The first thing I found that was a real shock was 7888 byte gets were a lot slower than 7887 byte gets. And in fact, 100K gets were faster than 7887 byte gets. And it took a lot of digging. And the part that's always amusing is you come up with this answer that's so simple. And it's like, it took you two weeks to come up with this one-line answer. And I don't know how many people are networking people, which I'm not really. But it turns out there's something called the Nagel algorithm. And the Nagel tries to guess when you're streaming data at it. And under certain circumstances, it will wait for the next data before proceeding. And that's exactly what's happening here. This is one of these... It's a buffer alignment issue. And it turns out that a 7887 byte put, uh, 7887 byte get exactly fills a buffer. So it says, hmm, I think there's more data coming. I think I'll wait 40 milliseconds. And 40 milliseconds goes by and there's no data. And it says, oh, I guess I'm done. And then it goes on to do the next get. And as a result, when you run with a 7887 byte get, every single get takes exactly 40 milliseconds longer than its previous one. So the thing that really surprised me was none of the developers had known. Swift had been around for like two or three years at the time. Nobody knew that that problem existed. And I would argue, maybe successfully or not, that, well, if they had get put, maybe they would have known that. But generally, people aren't looking at level, looking at data at that fine of granularity. And until you start looking at data the way I was showing you before in that table, it becomes less obvious what's going on as well. I was talking to some people during the break. I also found out that the Swift client is CPU bound, which is kind of a bit of a surprise. But if you run your tests on a faster client, you get higher IOPS. And as it turns out, again, weeks of digging and digging and digging. And it turned, it turned out, I found out, oh yeah, we're running SSL between the client and the server, and there's a lot of encrypting and decrypting going on with the packets going back and forth, and that beats up on the CPU, and that slows things down. Um, I also found a regression, which also turned out, it turned out that they came up with a new version of Swift, and the, um, the small object gets were taking twice as long as they were before. Digging, digging, digging. I found out there, it turned out they'd introduced a bug. And when, under certain circumstances, the, um, the database was being updated unnecessarily. And those unnecessary updates caused the gets to slow down. And as I said, nobody else noticed this kind of stuff because nobody was really looking. So what about Ceph? Because I know Ceph is big for um, SUSE, you know, storage, enter storage enterprise. Ceph Enterprise Storage, I think that's what, what Ceph stands for. And it's all based on the Ceph file system. And <clears throat> it turns out that Ceph supports 
a Swift API, so you can actually run the exact same calls to Ceph that you can with Swift. And since getPut talks to Swift, now it also talks to uh, Ceph. It also turns out that Ceph also supports a, a S3 API. I don't know if people know what S3 is, but that's the Amazon storage. And I added that. I actually, that was a Hack Week project I did a couple months ago, adding S3 support to get put. So now you can use get put to talk to Swift, Ceph, or even Amazon if you wanted to like try running some, some uh, benchmarking and getting some feel for comparisons and how well they all deal, how, how well they all do. Haven't done any of it, but it's something that's doable. I have been doing most of my Ceph testing on the uh, engineering cloud. And again, I don't know if anybody here has been using the engineering cloud for anything or not. But I found when I was running it, looking at the, out, looking at the data, there's some real weird stuff going on. Because the first thing that jumped out at me is, whoa, Ceph sucks. Um, its performance was terrible compared to Swift. Good news, we got past that, so... No, no, no problems there. But um, I was finding that, you know, when I was trying to run high levels of parallelism, we were having a lot of problems. And as it turns out, after a lot of work, that Ceph suffered the exact same problem that Swift suffered with the Nagel algorithm. <clears throat> and I found here the break point was 1447 versus 1448. And there was a setting inside Ceph where you could disable the Nagel algorithm. Personally, I think Ceph got it wrong. Their default is to enable Nagel, and they would let you with a config setting disable Nagel. The Swift guy said, no, we're just going to disable Nagel. It makes no sense. And depending on how you interpret the Nagel algorithm, there are conditions where you might get a little bit better performance on large objects with Nagel enabled, but it's really a corner case. And I think you need to design for the common case. And therefore, from a Ceph perspective, I think Nagel should always be disabled and only enable it if you really have a, a good case for it. But I digress again. But anyhow, from a benchmarking perspective, one of the reasons I said that I thought Ceph sucked was when I first started my efforts, I couldn't get over 1,000 IOPS. And I said, wait a minute, I've seen Swift easily do three, 4,000 IOPS with much smaller cloud backends than on the engineering cloud. And I'd be going back and forth in the uh, rocket chat room talking to people about it, and some people were saying, well, you know, the engineering cloud is a production cloud. You know, there's a lot of other users going on. You can't really expect to do benchmarking and get real numbers. And I kept saying, yeah, but I believe even on a production environment, you can do benchmarking if you understand there will be intermittent behavior caused by intermittent user loads. But I never, over the course of a week or two, rerunning these tests over and over and over and over, I never saw it go above 1,000. And I would argue if it was an intermittent problem, sometimes it would be under 1,000, sometimes it would be a lot higher. Anyhow, the good news is we finally got around that there was some more tuning that was able to be done. And, and we went from 1,000 IOPS to 5,000 IOPS. And again, it was a couple of settings, but it took a couple of weeks to figure out what those couple of settings were. Same thing with GETs. The GETs weren't getting over 1,400 IOPS. Now we're able to get over 7,200 IOPS. So, yes, it all goes through the RADOS gateway, and that's the real bottleneck here. Yes. So, so I've seen problems like this with the, the, the Rados gateway being a yeah. bottleneck for Swift and for S3. And then if you can somehow directly connect to the object stores themselves, then you can get much better performance. Yeah, no, I, I, that's what I've heard as well. And the, um, yeah, the bottom line is, again, for, uh, just for people who may not know what the Rados gateway is, that when they wrote Ceph, the big thing with Ceph was to support object storage and block storage, and it was all way cool. And they had their own APIs that he could do, you know, from a, from a block storage perspective, you just simply mount, mount a Ceph device, and now you've got block storage, and all, all the good magic happens for, happens for you. With the object storage, you would have to make calls to Ceph and say, I want to write a 6K object with this name into this uh, bucket, or I'd want to get an object with this name, etc. The problem is in the object storage um, 
arena or whatever, people want standardizations. If you're going to lock yourself in to using a proprietary Ceph API, then you're forever, until you rewrite your code, tied to Ceph. They want, customers want, a more open API. And one of the more open APIs is the, is the, um, is the Amazon S3 API. And I think that was later to the party. I think what Ceph first did was they implemented the uh, Swift API. And reading between the lines, I'm guessing Ceph was going for the cloud storage market with this. And in the cloud storage market, the big gorilla was Swift, not Amazon. Because in a private cloud, everybody would get a Swift implementation. The way they implemented the... Uh, Swift APIs through this thing called the Rados Gateway, which is, as it sounds, it's another server or application running a thing called RGW, Rados Gateway. And you talk to the Rados Gateway, Swift, on the one end, and on the back end, it talks to the Ceph native API. And as a result, as you say, that, that's a bottleneck. There's performance issues with the Rados Gateway. And I think what needs to happen is more effort needs to go into improving the performance of the Rados Gateway because that's exactly what we're seeing here. And if you're trying to compete in the object storage arena, you need to be able to compete with higher performance. And, and, that's, and that's exactly what I'm seeing here. And I think, and I, and I think it's going to get better. I really do. But this is just an example of you know, what has to happen. So here's the engineering cloud. And... Maybe I should have put this slide up earlier. But here's an example of what I was seeing with, with my get put. The table on the left shows 4K reads and write, gets and puts, and on the right, you know, before and after tuning. And as you can see, it's dramatically different. It's dramatically different. And the reason I would argue that we have a performance issue with Ceph, and I'm not saying it's Radis, I'm not saying it's Ceph, I'm just saying, as an independent observer running a client, I showed you those, those scaling numbers before with Swift, and I think that was a nine-server a nine Swift implementation, and we saw it scale up to like 50, 50 threads or more. When we're looking at it over here, it, actually, this is kind of going up to 50 threads as well, and then it's kind of starting to fall over. So... Maybe it's a little closer to Swift than I, than I was suggesting. But again, though, in all fairness, I think this was like a 12, I think this is like a 12 or 15 server uh, Ceph implementation. So it's a lot more servers than Swift. But again, the issue really points to the Radis gateway. And I think that using tools like GetPut, you can focus on trying to tune the Radis gateway. Maybe, I, I'm pretty sure I've heard that you can have multiple Radis gateways. So maybe what, what I would do is I would generate these numbers with one Radis gateway, then I would put in two Radis gateways and run it again, see what happens, then maybe put in three and run it again. And these are the exact numbers that salespeople are going to want if, they're gonna, if a customer says, hey, I've got a high workload, what do I need to do with Ceph or with Ces? So I wanted to put up a couple of slides on some interesting problems that this helped me get over with Swift. Um, so it has nothing to do with Ceph. Um, but these were the kind, and this is more kind of showing you what you can do with the kinds of data that you collect with GetPut. So I was doing some tests, and I found that as the number of, as the number of object I was creating increased, the Swift performance was severely decreasing. And if you look at this curve here, forget the right half, but just look at the left-hand curve. I went from zero to 15 million objects. And it, it, over time, the performance really started going down. And that was insane. I had no idea what was causing this. And then I also noticed when I got up to 15 million objects, I call this the cliff. The performance literally in the course of like a thousand puts, literally went from what was that? Maybe around 700 IOPS 
down to like 300. And it was like, boom. And again, digging, 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 weeks go by. You know, these problems, the answers are so simple, but getting, getting the answers can really be painful. It turns out that what happens if there's any Python people here, there's this encoding that Python uses called pickle. And for performance optimization inside Swift, they would keep a file that contained the MD5 sums of all the objects it was creating in a pickle file. And as the number of objects increased, the size of the pickle file increased. And it wasn't one pickle file for all the objects. The pickle file itself was uh, a hierarchical situation. But the point was, as the pickle file started getting hundreds or thousands of entries in it, and every time you wrote an object, you had to depickle it, append a new object, and then repickle it, as the number of objects were growing a lot, the performance went down the toilet. And I was at a meeting with some Swift developers, and I showed them the data. And one of the guys there, oh, we, were, we were wondering if something like that would ever be a problem. And the answer was, what they were going to do is they were simply going to append to the pickle file, and then in the background, figure out how to get rid of duplicates and do other kinds of stuff. And, the, and, that, and that line totally disappeared, totally disappeared. It turns out this problem here actually had to do with the inode cache that was being stored in uh, slab data. And what was happening was, this was a machine with, I think it was 256 gigs of RAM. And what was happening was after like 15 million objects, RAM was filling up with um, slabs. And if you actually looked at your slabs growing over time, which is something I was able to do with Collecto, but we can talk about that later, um, it started falling over. And it also turned out this was a known problem with um, XFS, which is what they use for the... Uh, a uh, file system that Swift runs on top of. <clears throat> and we also found that they were recommending, because there, there was a lot of information in this about, about XFS, nothing to do with Swift. But as you, as you increase the number of, ob of, of files on your file system, XFS started slowing down and filling up slab memory and stuff like that. Bottom line, in this case, two things helped here. One, we were running an older version of XFS, and a newer version of XFS had made some adjustments to be a little more uh, friendly to this kind of a situation. And the other thing was, we were using a default um, inode size of 1024 bytes for XFS, and I have no idea where that number came from or why they used it, but some of the uh, Swift people finally decided, you know, let's drop it to 256. So basically, you're cutting your inode size in a fourth, which automatically would at least move this line out you know, to like 60 million. So you're not going to completely get rid of it, but you're going to reduce the impact. That and the new version of XFS, it all but, it all but disappeared. Well, this was Swift. Yeah. Yeah, oh, right. <clears throat> right, yeah, and for, for people who didn't hear, was the question had to do with the, ex the extended attributes that you can use with the file system, and, that, and, and you're absolutely right. And one of the tunings that happened early on in Swift was to, like, disable modification times for files because do people really care about that kind of stuff and whatever they wound up with they they only needed 256 bytes in the uh, extended attributes but if you add additional things i'm sure you're right oh actually you know a part of it may be as well there's an option in swift where you can create your own custom attributes and maybe part of it was well if they're going to have a extra attributes, let's give them a bigger inode so that we can fit those attributes in there. And, and it turns out that was not a good idea. So 
Getting back to, to get put itself, there were a few additional options that I added over time that um, I'll just talk about real, real briefly. The first one is, by default, when you run a test with, let's say, eight threads, each thread writes to its own separate container, okay? And <clears throat> that kind of optimizes the Swift performance because it turns out that I was kind of shocked to hear that, you know, putting this in the context of this morning's talks, we're talking about, well, if you do this, you can shave 10, micro, 10 nanoseconds off, you know, your memory access things. I mean, great stuff. Swift is like this big hammer trying to drive in a little tiny tack because every time you write an object, every single time, Swift opens a MySQL database, inserts a line into the MySQL database, and closes the MySQL database. So when you see me doing 7,000 IOPS, that's 7,000 database opens, updates, and closes per second, which is insane. But it's able to do it. It's able to do it. So that's all really cool. That's all really cool. But shaving 10 micro shaving 10 nanoseconds off uh, memory access <laughs> isn't going to make a difference for that. But, <clears throat> but the point is, every container that you write your data into, and for those who don't speak objects, when people talk about containers or buckets, for all intents and purposes, those are directories. Okay? So basically what happens is, when you run Swift, you're basically writing a separate directory for each thread. And in turn, you have a separate database for each thread. So what that really means is if you were to write a million records into a container, you're going to have a, ta you're going to have a MySQL table with a million lines in it. And if you're going to do it on 10 threads, you're going to have 10 of them with a million lines in it. But if you do it all in one, you're going to have 10 million lines in this one poor little MySQL database. So that's the whole intent of this second container type called shared. When you say, I want a shared container, it literally uses one container and all the threads right into it. And the intent of that is really, I want to beat the hell out of, out of, out of Swift and MySQL. And I keep calling it, yeah. I want to beat the hell out of the database because that's the, that's the obvious bottleneck. And if we want to be able to try to see what's happening with bottlenecks and try to improve them or whatever, that's the way to, that's the way to beat the hell out of it. The by node was something that I just stuck in there kind of for grins. But it says that if you're running on 10 clients, you can say, well, each client is going to write to its own separate container. But if I had 10 threads on each client, then I'm going to have those 10 threads share the same. No, I, I, I almost never use that. But the main two ones that I use, I run by default, and you get a separate container for each thread. And if you run with shared, the performance goes in the toilet. But it's a way to really beat the hell up, excuse me, beat the hell out of the object database. Another thing that I added was if you're, if you're going to rerun your tests multiple times, you actually end up having a container that already exists if you're using the same container name and you don't have to recreate that database entry. What I wound up doing was saying if you add this UTC suite, if you add this UTC switch, it appends the UTC time onto each container name. So that guarantees that every time you run, you're gonna get a brand new, a brand new database and a brand new container. Again, from terms of repeatability, I don't want to run two tests having them both use the same container name, or I'm not really doing the exact same thing. Another thing that was useful is what I call latency distribution. If I run a test and I say my latency range was let's just say one to 100, just to have something to start with, of that one to 100, how many of them were one? How many of them were 100? How many of them were in between? So I added, I added a switch here that will allow you to print a little histogram and show you how many, took, how many took 10 milliseconds, how many took 20 milliseconds, how many took 30 milliseconds, and it gives you the ability to see Ooh, in this case, most of them took 10 milliseconds, but in this case, most of them took 40 milliseconds. That doesn't sound right. And 
Again, more data, you know, to do whatever you want. Swift has something called erasure coding that says, um, instead of writing my object to a single location, I'm going to take my object and break it. In. I don't know if people are familiar with erasure coding or not. It's kind of like, it's kind of like software RAID in a sense, in that instead of, you, you have this one object, and instead, currently when you write an object, the object turns into a file on a specific disk on a specific server. When you use erasure coding, you're saying, let's take that object and for sake of argument, we're going to break it into 10 pieces. And we're going to write those 10 pieces onto 10 disks on 10 servers. And by the way, we're going to write four more that are kind of the equivalent of RAID 5. And those four more mean you can lose one or two or three of those other segments and you have enough information to rebuild it. So it's kind of a, the whole intent really of erasure coding is to try to eliminate the need for full redundancy. Because right now, Swift and Ceph typically have what they call three-way three -way redundancy. So when you write an object, you're really writing three copies of the object. And that means you need three times as many disks. Whereas if you use um, erasure coding, I think the number was like 1.6 or 1.7. We, we could do the math. But you need less storage. And it's a way to save dollars. And if you're going to have a, a system with hundreds of disks or thousands of disks, using something like erasure coding can make a big difference. The only problem is erasure coding absolutely stinks for small objects. For big objects, it's okay. But for small objects, it stinks. So you really need to know what your workload looks like. And then the other thing I added was something I call exception reporting. Because sometimes when you look at your latency distribution, you may find, you know, most of, my, most of my puts took in this range. But, you know, there were a couple of them that were really slow. Why were they really slow? Well, with exception reporting, you can do a run and say, print out the IDs of all the objects that were slow. And then using those IDs, you can go into the Swift logs and find out how much time they spent in the container database, how much time they spent in the, object, in the object store, how much time they spent going through proxies and things. And you can at least start to zero in. You can find out which disk they were writing to. And then you can go through some data. I'll collect all data, which you'll hear me mention that a couple times. You can go into that data and actually see the specific disk it was writing to at that specific time. And oftentimes, you can see that that disk had an I.O. utilization of 100%. Or it might have had an average seek time of 500 milliseconds or something, which is way slow. And those, those can help you get a handle on why are, why are some of these operations slower than you thought they would be. So let's talk about a couple of benchmarks, kind of shift gears a tad. When I run a benchmark, this is my usual, this is my usual approximate go-to starting point. So the first line, the first line says, to translate this, it says, I want to create a container called C. I want to write, to an ob I want to write objects called O. And I want to run for 60 seconds. And I want to run several different object sizes, 1K, 100K, and a megabyte. And I want to append the UTC timestamps onto the container names. And I want to write a whole bunch of different process counts, one, two, four, eight, and I usually run up to like 64. This is what I'll do on a single client. If I'm going to be running multiple clients, I might go up to 512 or 1024, depending. Taking care not to exceed more than like 64 or 80 threads on a single client, because I, I know that that's kind of a sweet spot for clients. Then when you want, and then the second line says, I want to look at large object performance. So I might want to go from one megabyte up to 100 megabyte objects. And again, the reason I stopped at 100 megabytes is that's kind of a sweet spot for Swift. If you run a 500 megabyte object or a gigabyte object or a two gigabyte object, they all run at the exact same rates. They're streaming. Um, so I figured there's really no point in going above those numbers. But the other thing that's also really important to remember here, you'll notice I only, this only goes up to like 20 threads. And the reason is, if you, if you think about it for a minute, under load, Swift can do about, give or take, a couple hundred megabytes a second. And if you look at a network speed, give or take, you can do about a gigabyte a second. 
So that kind of says, hey, running five threads, I'm already at my network capacity. However, since Swift is front-ended with proxy servers and it's back-ended with object servers, you can usually get closer, you, you, you can usually get more threads out of it. Not a lot, but you can get more. So by going up to 20 threads, you can really see the graphs going up and then they taper off and, and this exceeds the benchmark speed so you can see that your, your um, network load is, is kind of sort of hanging steady but not getting worse. So it's kind of it kind of helps you demonstrate that Swift is able to run under exceeding its limits and not fall over. And then, after I do my basic benchmarks, the next step, it all depends on what it is that I'm trying to do. Um, I might want to, I might want to be, I might want to compare three, I might want to compare writing to shared containers versus separate containers. So I might want to rerun these whole set of tests and say container type, uh, shared and literally rerun. By the way, running these two tests together, I think takes on the order of two or three hours. So it's not horrific. Um, so you can get a couple of runs in every day if you want. Um, I might want to. I might want to try some with with um, three-way replication versus um, erasure coding. I might want to do some hardware changes. I might want to try running it with three servers or six servers or nine servers. I might want to try running it with, you know, two disks or four disks or eight disks or 20 disks. I might want to try changing the memory in some of my different hardware. I might want to try it with, I, I have done this. It's kind of nice when you work for a hardware company like HP. I have actually run some tests on 7,200 RPM disks versus 10,000 RPM disks. And yeah, you actually can see, you know, there's like a 20, 30% performance change because the disks are running that much faster. And then you can try plug it in some SSDs, but there's really no limit. There's really no limit to the kinds of, you know, changes that you can make. The only important thing is, and I think most people realize this, change one thing at a time. You know, you don't run a benchmark and then say, oh, I think this time I'm going to add three disks, subtract two servers, change these kernel settings, and I'll run it again. And then when you see a different number, you have no idea why it's different, because you changed too many things. So here's, I just want to show you a couple graphs just to give you an example of the kinds of stuff that you can see when you start playing with get put and varying things. So this graph on the left is showing what happens when you write to a single container. And what the three lines represent are uh, 4K puts, 128K puts, and 512K puts. And I think that's what they said. And, and what you can, let me just double check this. <laughs> one of my spectacles here. Um, yeah, that's what I thought. So what we're actually seeing happen is as, as you increase, um, yeah, as you increase the size of the objects, the, um, the natural thing that happens is when you increase the object size, you're writing more data to the disks, you're writing more data across the network, things are gonna slow down a little bit. So the large objects tend to run at a slower rate of IOPS. So what we're looking at on the very bottom one is, yeah, once, once we've gotten up to like, what's that, maybe 50 threads, we're probably saturating the network and we're just not gonna go any faster. What's happening with things like 4K objects, you're never gonna saturate the network, but you really, you really, um, wait a minute, I apologize. This is my mistake. <laughs> The one on the right is shared containers. The one on the left, what we're seeing is as you have the smaller objects, you can scale all the way up to almost, almost 9,000 almost 9, IOPS with this particular configuration. Whereas with the larger objects, you scale it a lot smaller. On the right, on the right, what we really want to do is when we run with a shared container, you can see that the, um, the 4K objects, which used to get up to 9,000 IOPS, would a shared container only get up to like 2,000 IOPS or 20, no, that's 3,000 IOPS. But you can see there's a, a significant difference in performance when you, in, when you uh, use the shared containers. Part of where all this came from was I was working on this large benchmark for Philips, and they wanted to install a large Swift system, and they wanted to know how their application was gonna perform. 
and the way they had written their code was they were moving from an S3 environment. And for people who don't know the, the Amazon S3 environment, <laughs> I don't know what, what, what idiot came up with this design. I think he was an idiot. You have to have a globally unique container name across all containers, across all customers, across the entire world. So if you're writing to a container, and I don't even know who the hell you are or what customer you work for, and I happen to pick the same container name, it's going to fail. So everybody like takes their, I think they take like their ID or, or some ID number and prepend it to every container name so they're guaranteed uniqueness. And then Amazon puts an additional restriction on you and says you only get 100 containers. You never get, you never get to write more than 100 containers for your entire space. So you get an Amazon account, you might want to run 50 applications on it, you only get 100 containers named to share across those 100 applications. So therefore, what you usually do is each application writes to one container. So in the case of Philips, their application only wrote to one container. And I was trying to convince them, you really don't want to write to one container. You can get much better performance if you have multiple containers. And showing them this graph kind of had a big, uh, made a big impression on them that, yeah, that's what can happen. I'm going to speed it up a tad because I am getting late. This top graph here is just showing the difference between running from a client that's... No, I'm sorry, these are server side. But in this case, the servers were either 1.8 gigahertz or uh, 2.3 gigahertz servers. And just changing, the, just changing the CPU speed of the servers made a big difference in performance. This guy on the left shows what happens when Swift uses things called proxies that are kind of sort of maybe similar to a Radis gateway, but not quite. But you can see that as you increase the number of proxy servers, you increase the performance. And I would suspect you might get something like this with Rados, but I don't know. Over here, I was changing the actual number of storage backends. So here we had three, six, and nine servers running for the Swift backend. The other really important thing to learn from this graph, and I think I even have it in a summary slide, but I want to reiterate because it's so important, is this is a scaling graph based on the number of parallel threads. Okay? So, if you take a look, and let's just take a look at the storage server back end for a second. At 50 threads, at 50 threads, there's Almost no difference in performance. Almost. You don't really see the difference until you start getting further out. So if you have a customer who has an application, and that application never writes more than 10 or 20 parallel operations, there's absolutely no reason ever to have a lot of servers in his, in his storage backend unless they need those servers to support more storage if you want to hang 100 disks off a server or something. But if you've just got a simple vanilla server, you know, with a half a dozen or a dozen disks on it, you're not going to improve performance by adding any more servers on the back end. And the same kind of sort of holds here with the scaling on the proxies. You could, you know, it starts to make a difference when you get up to the 50 or something, but uh, from 50 threads. But, you know, if you're only running 20, 30 threads, Adding more proxies isn't necessarily going to help you either. And this is a really important basic concept that a lot of customers, and quite honestly, other people, don't appreciate until you look at the numbers. I added a few more options. I'm just going to, real quickly, you can have, you can, uh, have random I.O., you can have really large containers with tens of millions of objects in them. You can, now you can have work, mixed workloads. You can do X percent reads, X percent writes. Uh, S3 support. You might want to try it with real long object names to see if that makes a difference in performance. This, this was a, everybody always keeps saying that with Swift, you needed SSDs to get better performance. And this was a study that I did. And without SSDs, once you got up to like two, two and a half million objects in the container, your performance really started going down the toilet. Here, using SSDs, the performance still tailed off, but I was able to get almost uh, 
you know, five, I think it was uh, 500 million. No, this test, I think I only went, this test, I think I only went up to like 300 million objects in a container, but that was a lot of objects. Um, but again, if I look at that no SSD test, if I'm never going to write to a container with more than a million objects in it, SSDs are not going to help. Again, we're talking Swift. I understand with Ceph, they talk about SSDs and it's a whole different architecture. But again, it's really important to understand the workloads so that you know <clears throat> whether or not a particular configuration change is going to help you. I wrote this tool called GP Suite that simply is a way to macro eyes and give tests names so you can say run my large object test and underneath it'll, do the, it'll be a bunch of stuff. Um, I'm just going to kind of pop through. I've mentioned Collectal. If you want to know more about Collectal, you can come to my Collectal talk tomorrow. Uh, some possible future work. I think, I think that you know, doing things with transaction IDs and Ceph would be great. With Swift, every, every operation has a transaction ID and you can trace it through all the logs and see what it did. Can't do that with Ceph. Um, I think it may or may not be useful to add Ceph-specific capabilities to get put, but I don't really know enough about Ceph. I would ask some Ceph engineering folks to help me. And um, there's a couple, we already talked about Radis Gateway and multiple gateways, and I already mentioned SSDs, so we'll just kind of leave it that way. The, the high, and I already mentioned this, but I'll reiterate that to do really high IOPS, you really need a lot of parallelism. And if you don't have a customer or a use case that has high parallelism, throwing more hardware or memory, or, it ain't gonna help. It ain't gonna help. Um, and, con and conversely, you know, I mean, these two kind of go hand in hand. If you have a lightly threaded application, who cares? You know, it, it's different. And as they say, it depends, you know, on what your particular workload is. So I guess I kind of used up almost all my time. I think I got like a minute or two for a couple questions. If anybody wants to, you know, I'm more than happy to ramble on and on and on. If, you know, I'll say, buy me a beer and, you know, uh, you can own me. Uh, um, <laughs> and, there's, and certainly, you know, hunt me down during breaks or whatever. But I think, are there any quick questions or we, we can talk offline then? Okay. Okay. Well, thanks a lot.